الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way he deserves to be praised and we bear witness that there is no object of worship that deserves any worship except Allah and Allah has no partners and we bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his messenger we ask Allah to exalt his mention and to grant him peace and to send his blessings and salutations upon him and upon his companions and wives and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until they have recompense. All you who have believed, fear Allah and be mindful of him the way he deserves to be feared. And do not allow yourselves to die except in the state of submission as Muslims. Brothers in faith, one of the characteristics and the qualities of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is as the scholars put it and as explained, أنه أوتي جوامع الكلم that he was given the ability to be very concise and precise in the usage of words. However, the meanings and the benefits behind the few words he used were tremendous. And that is a God-given quality, which one may improve and develop but fundamentally it's a gift from Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the best in this regard he would say very few words that had an unrealistic impact unrealistic according to human standards or in comparison to others of course they were realistic because the, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ exemplified and they were the manifestation and the embodiment of these words of the Prophet ﷺ. And if we all understand this concept and principle then there are many things to be deduced or acted upon or implemented as a result of this understanding. When we know that the choice of words of the Prophet ﷺ was something that was given to him by Allah, and therefore it is beloved to Allah, then we should be keen on being very exact when it comes to what we say and what we repeat after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because every word was the actual perfect right word and changing it in some way will take away from the blessings and the benefits that have been promised in whichever hadith we have from the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam and this is something that we have evidence for when one of the companions merely replaced the word Rasul with Nabi or Nabi with Rasul. Even though they are interchangeable in the sense that 
the Prophet and the Messenger, it's referring to the same thing. But the Prophet ﷺ corrected him and insisted on a particular word because that was the way he taught them how to make a dua. And you may not replace that one word with another word thinking that it is better or superior. And even though the meaning might be the same, there's no major alteration in the meaning. The promise that has been given for you making this dua will no longer be yours. Because you have changed what you were supposed to keep as is. And it is very sad that today you can go to any Islamic bookstore and you can find books with hundreds if not thousands of pages of compilations of dua. 20% of which would be from the Prophet وسلم, and 80% from Mawlana Abu Halwa. From the beginning till the end. And you see people doing Umrah and Hajj with a book this thick, walking around, repeating words <coughs> that sometimes don't even make sense. He's doing Umrah saying, oh Allah, accept our Hajj. And you have the mutawif who's screaming in the middle of the haram as if he has some exclusivity to the haram and there are no other people except him and his followers. He screams, they say ameen. He doesn't know what he's saying. They don't know what they're saying ameen to. But it's enough to disturb the peace in the haram. And how dare you try to enjoy the good and forbid the evil and say, ya akhi, you're disturbing us without being looked down upon and frowned like you're some shaitan who's interrupting their act of worship. When in reality you're trying to maintain peace, this is a haram. Make dua between you and your Lord in private. You want to make a congregational dua in this manner, which is a whole other discussion, you may not do so by harming other people. That's like you entering a masjid and everybody who's praying in nafila is praying out loud. You will not know how to pray your sunnah. So they are basics, fundamentals. Anyways, not to shift from the topic. The dua. <clears throat> the dua that these human beings, no matter how big the sheikh is or how long his turban is, and what lineage he has and how he's connected to I don't know who whether he's a Sharif or he's not a Sharif forget about all these gimmicks all of these nonsense that we we added to the deen our criteria of evaluation the length of the beard the length of the imama the dress code who he says he comes from which tree which family tree whose his sheikh is or his grandfather is those things don't make a difference in the deen. Maybe 1% in some way, they can come for your aid. The person, whoever he is that's writing a dua, that you're following, I ask you by Allah, have you memorized the adriya of the Prophet ﷺ himself and you're done with all of them that you're now looking for more? And the truth of the matter is, you will hardly find a single Muslim in this world who will say, yes, I've memorized all the dua and I'm hungry for more. So now I'm going to Mawlana. You will not find this person. We all have some sort of deficiency in learning the adriya of the Prophet wasallam. even though they are the absolute best, the most guaranteed, you have a guarantee and a warranty and whatever you want. Insurance. If you want to talk about halal insurance. Insurance that this is in line with what Allah revealed. <coughs> Yet, how many of us know the 
the, the supplications that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam often made. I would still say very few. Go through any book of hadith, authentic book of hadith, from the azkar of the morning or the evening or the various azkar or the various adriya, you will be baffled of how much we don't know and how many missed out opportunities we have. And this is the state of the Ummah. Believe it or not, it is not surprising. This isn't surprising. The affair of the Ummah in relation to the Sunnah is such. In every way, in every respect. It is not just the fact that we're not using the Dua of the Prophet Wasallam. That's one part of the problem. It's the whole Sunnah altogether. For most Muslims, it's not good enough. Let's just be real and stop the bluffing and the sugarcoating. For most Muslims, the Sunnah is not good enough. It's not, it's not cool enough. It's not modern enough. It's not hip enough. It's not fashionable enough. Whatever the reasons may be that we know something is from the Sunnah, I mean the obligatory aspects of the Sunnah, and then we still just don't care about it. We have preferences. And our preferences are such that it is not important. That's the affair of the Ummah. So it is not a surprise that we are away from the Dua. This does not mean, however, that we should continue being like this. Or that it is okay and that no reminder should be made to awaken us from our coma. I will share with you dua, inshallah, in this khutbah, which is considered one of the most comprehensive supplications ever. And one which the Prophet ﷺ taught his companions, and one which the scholars say, it is highly, highly recommended that you learn it, you memorize it, and you use it. And you'll be deprived in so many ways if you were to let this opportunity go. And if you were to miss out on it. And this dua, which was collected by Imam Muslim in Sahih, and narrated by the noble, honorable companion Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu wa ardah, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, Allahumma aslih li deeni alladhi huwa ismatu amri wa aslih li dunyaya allati fiha ma'ashi wa aslih li akhirati allati ilayha ma'adi wa ja'al al-hayata ziyadatan li fi kulli khair wa al-mawta rahatan li min kulli shar A few sentences If you were to read them for a couple of weeks every single day inshallah you will memorize them Allah will make it easy for you. You will memorize them. Don't be stingy. And when you learn what they mean, you will be encouraged to memorize them, inshallah. The Prophet wasallam used to ask, Oh Allah, set right, rectify, fix my religious commitment. For it is the safeguard of my life. My affair, my whole affair is safeguarded by my religious commitment. And so the most important asset that you possess as a believer is your religious commitment. If Allah sets it right for you, if Allah rectifies it for you, if Allah fixes it for you, then all of your affairs are going to be they're going to fall into place in the same manner. And the first benefit from this hadith is that the first thing that the Prophet ﷺ asked about before he asked about the matters of the dunya and the akhirah was the deen, the religious commitment. And of course a whole lecture can be given on what is the reality of the religious commitment and how do we improve it. But time doesn't allow. We've discussed this in other occasions. Fundamentally speaking, 
It is that you live by the two principles of worshipping Allah alone according to the way of the Prophet And you stay away from the areas of, of trials and tribulations. You avoid the areas of trials and tribulations so you can keep your religious commitment intact. The more we mix with the evil environment, the more it creeps in into us, the less is our guard. The, the more we lower our guard, then we start becoming exposed to the fitna. And then the religious commitment weakens and weakens and we seek Allah's forgiveness. So that's a full-time job right there. That's a full-time job. How many of us ask Allah to fix his religious commitment specifically? We may be asking for different things, risk and what have you, and power and strength. But that particular dua from the Prophet ﷺ teaching the Ummah that you, the first concern you should have is that Allah keeps you firm upon this religion because then you don't have to worry about much. However, that does not mean that you should become negligent of your dunya. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, and set right for me my word, my worldly affairs, because in it is my living. And that means it's permissible for you to want to have a good job and a good lifestyle so that you're not in the state of deprivation, you're not in the state of being in need, and that will distract you from focusing on the important things. If Allah facilitates your worldly affair, this will give you more time to focus on your religious matters. And so there's no harm in that. And the Prophet wasallam asked that Allah rectifies worldly affairs. Did not want to be poor per se, or needy. And then thirdly, the Prophet wasallam asked Allah wasallam to rectify his al-akhirah, his akhirah, his life to come, his year after. To which is my final abode. So if Allah Azza wa Jal has prepared for you paradise and therefore has rectified for you, has set right for you your, your life to come, then what else do you want? What else is there to stress about, to worry about? Absolutely nothing. So so far you've asked Allah for religious commitment, for your dunya to be facilitated for you, and then Allah Azza wa Jal rectifies your life to come. Because someone may have what appear to be the first two, but then is deprived of the last one. In a sense, the Prophet Sallallahu said that one of, one of you will be doing the deeds of the people of Jannah until there's only a hand span between him and the life to come. Then his predestination takes over, and then he does the deeds of the people of the Hellfire, and then he goes to the Hellfire, وَعِيَادُ billah. Meaning outwardly was something, inwardly was something else. And that's dangerous. One may look religious and have a comfortable life, but the akhirah is not secure. It is not secure. So it is important that we ask Allah for the security of the life to come. Then the Prophet wasallam added two more things which we will discuss in the second part of the khutbah inshaAllah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم went on to say. وَجْعَلِ الْحَيَاةَ زِيَادَةً لِي فِي كُلِّ خَيْرٍ O oh Allah, make this life a means for me to increase in every type of goodness. Alhamdulillah. Wallahu Akbar. At the beauty of the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how comprehensive and important is this dua. O oh Allah, make this life means for me to attain as much as much good as possible. And this is why the scholars have a discussion about making dua for someone to live a long life without adding the condition of inobedience. Meaning it's a local expression to say Tal Amra. Or you say to someone Atal Allahu Amruka. 
May Allah lengthen your life span. That could be actually a dua against someone and not a dua for someone. Because the Prophet wasallam said the best of people are those who live long with good deeds. And the worst of people are those who live long with evil deeds. So if you merely say, may Allah give you a long life, if you don't say in obedience, you could actually be making dua against this brother. Because if he is engaged in sinfulness and Allah gives him a long life, instead of having in his account 50 years of sinfulness, he will have 80 years of sinfulness. That's another 30 years that he doesn't want. Trust me. And therefore it is not recommended, nor is it allowed to say this expression unless you add the condition in obedience in righteousness and yes our religion is this particular because it's a dua at the end of the day it's a dua and so as long as you're alive as long as you're in this life you should ask Allah to make it means for you to attain all types of good and so you involve yourself in whatever good you can offer to yourself to your family, to the society, to your relatives, to your neighbors, and so on and so forth. You'll be like a source of good, like a fruitful tree, constantly providing and giving. And then the last part of the dua is the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَجْعَلِ الْمَوْتَ رَاحَةً لِي مِنْ كُلِّ شَرْ And make death means for being saved from every type of evil. And when the Prophet وسلم, saw a man was being carried on the shoulders of people to be buried, he made a comment about he's either, he's either going to be relaxed or others are going to be relaxed. They said, oh, Messenger Allah, what does that mean? He said, he was, if he's a righteous person, then he's going to be relaxed. He doesn't have to deal with the headache of the dunya. The worrisome of the dunya, rent and whatever problems you have, khalas, you're done with that. You've gone to Allah's mercy. If you were a good person, a good Muslim, you've already gone to Allah's mercy. Murtah, you're in a state of comfort, relaxation. But on the other hand, if it is an evil person, then the, whole, the Prophet said the whole world is relaxed from his existence, including al dawab wa shajar including animals and trees. The evil person, the corrupt person that goes around causing problems all over the place, the whole world hates him. The whole creation of Allah hates him. And when he dies, all of them are relaxed from his presence and his evil. Look how serious the matter is. So when you die, if Allah makes death means for you to be saved from every evil, then you don't have to worry about anything anymore. Because your akhirah begins with your death. When one of us dies, it is his qiyamah. As the scholars say, it is your qiyamah. It is yawm al-qiyamah for you. In a sense that there's no more deeds. You would already know from the grave where you will end up. You will already know from the condition of the grave and the questions in the grave and whether it will be a garden from the gardens of paradise or a pit from the pits of the fire. You know what's next. We will know what's next. Nothing to stress about anymore. But it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to reach that stage where one of us dies, he can be at peace. That I have no more evil to worry about then what's coming after is only going to get better. The life in the barzakh, in the interval, is going to be good. On Yawm al-Qiyamah, in the presence of all of mankind, all of the creation of Allah, before Allah, it's going to be good. When people enter paradise and others enter the hellfire, you know that you're going to Jannah, it's going to be good. And then absolutely once you're in Jannah, it's all good. It's all good. And at no point in time, Will you ever feel any ill feeling of any type? Not even 
wishing for things, not even feeling deprived, not even hoping. Khalas, those feelings will be removed and cleansed. You will be in the, even if you're the last person to enter Jannah, and you have the least property in Jannah, you're going to feel like the biggest king of all. You're content with what Allah gave you. That's Jannah. But how do we, how do we get to this stage? What are we doing now to get to this stage? What type of investment are we putting to get this return on investment? To get this security from all evil? What? Each one of us can ask these questions and each one of us has his own answers. Whether we are close or far or not even on the path. Whichever one it is, Allah is merciful. Never will Islam tell you you're, you're so bad, don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about being good. Never. Everything is in Islam is about returning us back to Allah. Acknowledgement of sin, repentance from sin, feeling guilty, feeling remorseful, and intending and changing our ways. That's the whole religion. That's the cycle of Islam. You sin, and then you seek repentance from Allah. And then you sin, and then you seek repentance from Allah. This is your cycle. Don't think you're going to be on a state of righteousness, you know, in this immaculate condition. It doesn't belong to any human being. Every son of Adam is sinful. And as I've mentioned many times, don't ever let the shaitan tell you, you're so far off, there's no point in trying. There's no such thing. I will just finish the khutbah with the hadith of the man who killed 99 souls. Just so you can understand the reality of what it means to change our ways and how easy Allah made it. A man, before the time of the Prophet he told the Sahaba, killed 99 people for no reason. It was a hobby. He's a serial killer. Just you mess with him, you say something he doesn't like, he, chop off, he chops off your head. It's cool for him. Criminal. Still, something inside was bothering him. Can't live like this anymore. 99 people, yaqi. Not nine. 99 people now he's suddenly feeling that he wants to change. Someone will tell him, khalas, you straight to Jahannam. What are you talking about? He went and asked for a person of knowledge. He couldn't find one. He found a abid. Someone who's praying all the time, fasting all the time, says Allah khair, but no knowledge. He told him, I killed 99 people. Is there any hope for me, for mercy, for forgiveness? He told him, you've killed 99 people? Too late. He said, okay, thank you so much. And he killed him. Of course. It's 99, 100, 110, what's the difference? If you're giving me no hope for change, then you might as well die. And the guy got himself killed with the wrong fatwa. Ignorant. Say, I don't know, yaqi. Say, I don't know, Allah is better for you. Until now, people send me all these messages on WhatsApp. Sheikh, ya I'm not a sheikh. Sheikh, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. I just, I don't know. How do you not know? What do you do? What do I look like to you? I'm a human being like you. If I know, I will tell you. If I don't know, I don't know. It's not, and I don't feel bad. I feel happy. Alhamdulillah, I don't know. Because it's a big responsibility to tell you something and what I don't know. Learn how to say you don't know. And people of da'wah say I don't know. And you're not a person of da'wah. It's more likely that you don't know as well. It, it's not a shame. It's not a shameful act. Imam Malik did it. Imam Shafi'i did it. Who are we? Say I don't know. And he didn't tell him I don't know. He got himself killed. <coughs> the man, now that he has killed a hundred people, still wanted to change. He went to a scholar. Told him, Ya Sheikh, killed a hundred people. Is there any hope for me? He said, Who will come in between you and the mercy of Allah? Of course, man. Of course, whatever you've done in the past, it's okay. But you're living in this evil environment. Go from this city to that city. Whatever the city was. There are good people over there. Yalla. That environment will help you overcome this life of crime. You won't be in the same areas where you used to commit crime, so yourself <laughs> encourages you to do it again. And the man said, Jazakallah khair. He grabbed himself, 
and started moving towards the city. He has not prayed yet. He has not fasted. He hasn't done any act of worship at all. Zero. Nada. He just started moving towards that city. He died. The angels, the angels of mercy came and the angels of punishment came. Everybody's arguing over his soul. The angels of, of punishment said, this evil person killed the hundred, never done a good deed in his life. He's going to Jahannam. We should take him. And the angels of mercy are arguing their point. Allah Azza wa Jal obviously is the one that will give the final verdict. So Allah said, measure the distance. Is he closer to the other city where he was? Or is he closer to the city he was going to? And then Allah made the earth shift. So that he is closer to the city he's going to. And the angels of mercy took him and he was done. Can you come and tell someone afterwards, Ya Akhi, you're so evil, A'udhu Billah, you're a shaitan, there's no hope in you? La this is Islam. This door, have you committed a hundred? I hope you didn't. I hope you haven't killed a hundred people. I know any one of us has done probably less than that. Far less than that. But the door of mercy is open. It takes some acknowledgement. It takes some effort. It takes some private conversation with you and your Lord. In your sujood. Asking Allah for His mercy and to guide us and learn this dua, my brother. Learn this dua. It's a beautiful dua. It's a valuable dua. Learn it. Say it before the taslim. Say it in sujood. Say it after the salah. Say it in the morning. Say it in the evening. Don't restrict it to one thing so it will not become an innovation. Don't add it at one point every single day if the Prophet ﷺ didn't do so. But it's a general dua that you should be familiar with. Perhaps Allah Azza wa will accept it from you. And you will live by it. And you will be among those who are successful. Ameen. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub. Thabit qulubana ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarrif al-qulub. Isrif qulubana ala ta'atik. Rabbana la tuzil qulubana ba'da ad hadaytana. Wa rablana min ladunka rahmatan innaka anta al-wahab. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fi al-akhirati hasana. Wa kina adab al-nar. وصلي اللهم وسلم على نبي المختار